Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Welcome to Masterclass Friday here at Adobe Live. My name is Terry White, worldwide photography evangelist here at Adobe. It's my pleasure to be streaming to you live once again on one of my favorite days, if not my favorite day of the week. Not because it's Friday, not because it's the end of the week, not because the weekend's coming, but more so because I get to do my masterclass for all of you. So uh, just a couple quick house rules, as we always do at the beginning of this, taking a few seconds. Uh, if you are new to Adobe Live, um, welcome. If you're watching on the replay, thanks for watching the replay. The replay numbers do count. Before people that are new can ask, will this be recorded? It is always available for replay unless something technically goes wrong. So yes, you can always watch it again and again and again as much as you want. Uh, if you are watching somewhere else, like I see Kevin and uh, Franco over on Facebook, and I see people on YouTube and Twitter and LinkedIn and um, different places watching, that's cool. You can hang out there. But if you want to participate in the main chat that I'll be definitely trying to pay attention to the most, then head over to b.net slash Adobe Live and join uh, Jan and Tom and and Kiss My Creative, and William, and Oliver, and Sean, and Bruce over there. So either way, you can hang out where you are. Uh, I'll try to see the other chat, but if I don't see the other chat, and you really got something urgent you need to find out, you can always ask it in the Adobe Live chat. And even if I don't get to it, chances are one of the moderators or other smart people in the chat will get to it and answer your question as well. So with that said, what is today about? Today is about... Photoshop filters. Um, one of the things I realize is that while I, you know, show a filter here and there throughout the course of a masterclass, I haven't really done a whole topic on the filters that you should know as photographers. Now, I won't get through every filter today because there are dozens and dozens of filters that are generic filters that don't necessarily apply to photographers. And just because there's more filters than I have time for, even if I wanted to cover them all. So I couldn't do them justice in an hour if I wanted to. But I, I cherry picked some of my favorites. I cherry picked the ones I think you should know. And therefore we're gonna start off with a, um, we're gonna start off with a technique you should know no matter what filter you're using. So without further ado, let's head over to my desktop so you guys can see what I'm doing. Here I am, and I'm not in Photoshop, but this is where I'm going to get some of my images from. I am in Lightroom Classic. This is irrelevant to today's class. It just happens to be where my images are stored. So I'm going to go ahead and, and by the way, I shouldn't say it's irrelevant because I even noticed some people in the chat say, well, I don't use Photoshop that much. And I'm assuming because they're using Lightroom more. Um, this is one of the reasons when people say, what do I need Photoshop for? It's because Photoshop can do the kinds of things you're about to see that Lightroom can't. Um, so there's a reason for Photoshop and vice versa. When people always say, I have Photoshop, I can edit an image any way I want. What do I need Lightroom for? There are things that Lightroom can do that Photoshop can't in terms of managing images that Photoshop can't even touch. So there's a big reason for both applications. Even if you're like siloed into one, um, it means that you're not really taking the other side of that equation seriously. Because I couldn't imagine not having Lightroom uh, when it comes to managing images, and I couldn't imagine not having Photoshop when it comes to being able to edit any way I want. So they both serve a big purpose. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and uh, grab the first image. I'm going to do a quick keyboard. Well, actually, I'll show it from the contextual menu instead of doing a keyboard shortcut you can't see. Let's go to edit and edit in Photoshop. And because that's a, a raw file, a DNG, it will just automatically open up a copy of that raw file and here we are in Photoshop. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is something you could have done in Lightroom because I'm going to show you a filter. Well, actually, the second thing I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a filter that for all intents and purposes, all of those functions in the filter I'm going to show you are in, are in, are in Lightroom. But if you wanted to do the specific thing I'm about to show you on a layer, that's where it becomes interesting to do it in Photoshop. So first, before we even get to that filter, let's talk about setting you up for success. Now, even though I opened up a copy, and even though no matter what I do to this photo, destroy it, mess up, whatever, I can always get back to the copy that's over in Lightroom. So I don't really worry too much about making a big mistake here, 
because I, in worst case scenario, I'll just start over from the original that's over in, in Lightroom. But if you want to work in Photoshop and maybe you don't have an original in Lightroom, maybe you're not using Lightroom at all, then um, this is important for doing non-destructive work with filters. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is for most, not all, but for most of the filters, they support something called Convert for Smart Filters. And this is just a fancy way of saying, convert the layer you're on, or in this case, the background, into a smart object. So in other words, what's a smart object for those of you who are new to Photoshop? Because I know a lot of you are photographers that don't use, um, don't use Photoshop every single day, you're using Lightroom. So it, it basically gave it this little icon in the layers panel. It converted my, here, let me undo it so you can see it. So um, it started off as just a regular layer. And let me see if I can revert it all the way back. Yeah, okay, it is all the way back. Started off as just a regular layer, right? And when I did that command, hang on, let me go do it. Convert for Smart Filter. It changed the icon to this little icon, this little, um, like, I don't know, page with a piece torn out of it. I don't know what that's supposed to represent. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's my smart filter layer, smart object thumbnail uh, icon. So what's a smart object? So imagine taking, a, designing a cake. Like you, you put the frosting on it, you wrote on it. It's a beautiful cake and you don't want someone to accidentally touch it. You don't want someone to put their finger in it and smear it and do things to it because that will mess up the frosting and you would have to start over again. So you take the, let's say it's a small cake. You take the small cake, you open up a piece of Tupperware, you drop the cake in and you close the Tupperware. And I'm using the brand Tupperware. I don't care if it's not Tupperware, any piece of plastic container you, will, you like, if you don't like Tupperware, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, you take the plastic container, you drop the cake in, you close the lid, and now the cake is somewhat protected. You can write on the, on the plastic container, it doesn't affect the cake. You can kind of even start to bend and twist the plastic container. It doesn't affect the cake unless you do it too much. So think of that plastic Tupperware-like container, that's the smart object. So that's protecting what's inside the smart object from permanent damage. So if I run a filter while it's a smart fil smart object, the filter will show me the appearance because I'm doing the filter on the outside of the container, but it won't affect the inside. So I can do whatever I want and not affect the inside and I can always delete the smart object I can or delete the effects of the smart object, anything I want. So that's what a smart object does. So now that we've made a smart object using that command, convert for smart filter, which is now grayed out, I can go run a filter, and the first filter we're gonna talk about is the camera raw filter. The camera raw filter, this is what, this is the second part I was talking about earlier that's basically bringing up camera raw in another window. <laughs> Let me move it over. Bringing up camera raw in a window, and basically, for those of you who are Lightroom users, this is bringing up the develop module in a window. So it's all the same controls, it's all the same features, it's all, well, 99% of the features, for example, crop's not there. And you say, well, why isn't crop there? Because you can crop in Photoshop. You don't need to do that in Camera Raw. But there are some things that aren't there, but 99% of it's there. All the adjustments are there, all the abilities are there. And the difference is, in Lightroom, you're doing this either on a, the entire image or you're doing it on a, on a mask that's part of the image. And even when you do a mask, you don't get all the controls. This can do it on the entire image, which in this case we are, or it can do it on a layer. You can do camera raw filters layer by layer. You can also apply multiple camera raw filters layer by layer. So you can really, really, really get into um, more details, I should say, with the camera raw filter on a pixel by pixel, layer by layer, smart object by smart object basis in Photoshop than you could in Lightroom or camera raw itself. And also, 
Traditionally, Camera Raw required it be a raw file or a JPEG or a specific format. This doesn't require anything other than a layer. It can, you can do this on any layer that supports pixel editing. All right, so uh, for example, let's, let's do a couple things here. Let's do an auto exposure. Um, let's do that. Let's go in, and now I'm going to actually bring down the exposure a little bit more. I don't like it to be that bright. And there's a sidewalk over here on the left-hand side that's totally like in the night sky. We can't see it. So I'm going to hit the mask icon, which is in Camera Raw, which is also in Lightroom. And I'm going to grab the paintbrush. And with the paintbrush, I'm just going to go in, make my brush a little smaller with my left bracket key. I'm just going to go ahead and paint the sidewalk, which all I'm doing right now is masking it. So nothing's happening to the sidewalk just yet. I'm just identifying the area of the sidewalk that I want to be affected. All right. Now that I've done that, anything I do um, while I'm here and it's still brushing, hang on, anything I do, will affect that area of the image. So if I come down here, oh, I'm getting a lag. Oh, it's, it's waiting for me to catch up. Okay, if I come down here and I adjust the exposure, uh, the exposure is only happening in that area that I painted. If I adjust the uh, temperature for whatever reason, the temperature is only being affected by the area that I painted. So that way I can go in and I can play with all these different effects in the camera raw, just like I normally would, but only affecting the areas that I work on. So I can add, for example, another mask. I can add another mask and I can say this time, select sky. And that will use the AI powered select sky, just like it does in camera raw, just like it does in Lightroom. And I could, for example, um, scroll down and do a little bit of dehaze on the sky, make it a little bit richer, a little bit more moody. I could also adjust the, um, the exposure of the sky, make it darker, make it brighter. I could also adjust the temperature, make it bluer, make it warmer, um, whatever I don't want. I can add another mask, add another one. Let's do a brush this time again. And this time we're gonna go ahead and paint on the water. And I'm not being careful, I'm not zooming in, so don't critique my brushing skills. This is just a quick demo of what can be done this is, not, this is not going to be my final image. <laughs> All right, so now that we've done that, for example, maybe I want to make the water bluer, so I just adjust the temperature more towards the blue, and that kind of matches the sky. So I can keep going, keep going, keep going, doing as much as I want, but now the difference is when I click OK, let's say I'm finished for now, because I did that as a smart object, we see it, and we see it on the layers panel as a smart filter that means I can always turn it off. I can always double click to get back to whatever filter I ran and get back to the settings that I ran with it. So for example, just turn it off. It's not because it, it's just on the smart object. It's not affecting the actual contents of the smart object. Turn it back on. Oh, wrong on. There we go. Turn it back on. Double click the camera raw filter get right back to the same settings, same slider, same everything that was done. So if I decide, hey, I would love to make the overall image crazy more saturated because that looks like the sky's on fire now. <laughs> but if I wanted to do that, I could. I can make it more desaturated, but I can do whatever I want. And if I click and make that mistake and make a print and don't like it, I can always come back and make changes. So um, making your layer or your background a smart object first before running filters is always going to give you that safety net of always coming back and saying, oh my god what was i thinking with that saturation that's crazy let's bring the saturation back down to zero and click ok and i can always just get back to whatever it is i did now if i needed to adjust the pixels of the actual contents. In other words, the skyline, these pixels. Notice, for example, when I get a paintbrush, I can't paint on this. I get, I'm getting a big nose symbol for my painting. If I go to the con content aware um, spot healing brush, I can't content aware out that pole in the background because it's saying, no, 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 
that would be affecting the actual pixels of the image and you can't do that because this is a smart object. So the smart object's also protecting the contents from me actually doing something that I don't want to do by accident. But let's say, no, 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 this, this, I don't know if that's a bridge, but yeah, that's a bridge. But we're going to take the suspension out of this bridge. It needs to go, or maybe this line out of the sky, it needs to go. Then what I would need to do is double click on the thumbnail for the smart object, which will open up another, another window, another uh, tab. And now I'm actually back to working on the original image. So this is unprotected. So whatever I do here is permanent. Whatever I do here does affect the actual image. So if I take this line out of the sky, out of the clouds there, maybe that was a jet stream, I don't know. But if I take that out, it's gone. And then when I'm done and I uh, close this and save it, it will take me back to the image that has the smart object once it finishes saving. There we go, I see it down there in the bottom left corner behind me, saving. And now the line is gone, but the filter is still applied to the rest of the pixels. So again, I can always turn the smart object or the filter off. The line doesn't come back because we did that permanently. We went into the actual pixels and changed it. But all the effects of the filter remain the same. And um, I might also want to straighten this image because it's crooked and it's driving me nuts. So let's straighten it a bit. There we go. And we straighten it. Okay, so now we've got our, our hang on one more. Pull that up a little bit more. There we go. Now we got our finished image and we can save it. And because we uh, layered this file, it's saving it with the layers. Here you can see in the lower left corner, the save progress bar is going there. And, um, and by the way, if you see something taking a little bit longer than you think it should take to save, it's also most likely saving it across my network to my server. So that image may not be local. Anyway, um, saved it, close it, head back to Lightroom. And Lightroom put the copy, the PSD, the Photoshop file, right next to the original that's still untouched, unharmed, still has the, the line in it with the sky, still has everything done, nothing's been changed. And then there's the one that I played with that I can always go back into and work with the layer and work with the smart object and so forth and so on. Okay. Um, and I see some people over on, on YouTube giving love. So thanks. I'm glad that the explanation was crystal clear. Uh, OA uh, and greetings from Slovenia and Cyprus. And hello, everybody over on YouTube and, and Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Rodney over on LinkedIn. Anyway. All right. Let's continue on. So we learned two things. Convert for, for convert to smart filter or convert to a smart object first before running filters whenever possible. Two, first filter for photographers you should know, the camera raw filter. Again, there's no reason to go to Photoshop just to run that filter if you're already in Lightroom because everything you're going to do in, in the camera raw filter you could have done in Lightroom. But if you're doing it in a creative way, if you're doing it to multiple layers, if you're doing it to something that isn't in Lightroom, then the camera raw filter is a great way to do it. Filter number two, and let's go back to Photoshop for this one. This is one of my all time favorite filters. I got to scroll down to my examples here. One of my all time favorite filters, the liquify filter. So the liquify filter is for pushing and squeezing and expanding pixels and moving them around in the image. Now, for example, this is a stock photo. I don't know who this woman is, but this, this, elderly lady in the stock photo, her sweater is bulging out on this side. Like it's not too bad on this side, but it makes her arm look weird on this side because of the bulge. Now, if you were taking the photo, you might step over or ask someone to step over and say, hey, can you tuck that in a little bit? It's kind of sticking out on one side, making it look weird. But if it didn't happen in, in, in the actual photo, you can have actually make it happen in post. So once again, I'm, I may not remember to do this every time, by the way, but you remember to do it, convert for smart filter. If I don't remember to do it, because I don't care, I'm not saving these, I'm not keeping these, uh, just know that I forgot to do it. 
Okay, so converted for smart filter. Now I can go run the filter I want. Filter, liquefy. So in the liquefy filter, which is probably going to pop up in a window over there. That's what I thought on my other display. Okay. In the liquefy window, you see your entire image. And then you see tools on the left-hand side. And you see controls on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, I just want to see... Um, there is a setting that I just want to make sure it's on for you, but maybe it's not a setting anymore. Anyway, um, there's one checkbox I want to make sure you enable before you use the um, Liquify filter. It, it will it's sticky. It will stay checked forever once you check it, so you don't ever have to do it but once. And that is this pin edges uh, checkbox. This is unchecked by default. You want to make sure that the first time you use liquefy you head over and the first thing you do is do this because if you don't do that what will ultimately happen at some point is your let's say i uncheck it you're going to be liquefying something close to the edge of the photo like maybe i was trying to look push her hair down and liquefy her hair and then by accident you're going to do this and this is what you're going to get on your photo and if you didn't notice it we'll notice it see that little dip in the top of the photo because the edge of the brush touched the edge and pulled the edge of the frame in and that's a dead giveaway you liquefied something because we see this little dip in your image and it will it will export it as white uh, but we see the little white dip in your image in the corners or on the sides or on the bottom and that's a dead giveaway you liquefied something so undo pin edges and now with the edges pinned I cannot get a dip in my image. I can liquefy and distort it and mess it up, but it will not pull the, uh, the side of the image in. So if you're trying to liquefy things close to the edge, turn on pin edges so that you don't ever accidentally pull the actual edge of the image in, unless that's what you were trying to do. So I, I, maybe you're trying to do something creative and you wanted the edge pulled in, you can certainly do that. All right, but here, let's go fix what we're trying to fix in this photo. Let's go over. Now, um, first of all, what tool am I going to be on? There's a tool here. Let me hide the other tools. There's a tool up here in the upper left corner called the um, Forward Warp Tool. That's the tool I use most of the time. But <laughs> Photoshop detectives, yes. Uh, as Oliver says, the Photoshop detectives will say, aha, we, we, we see what you did there. We, we caught your mistake. Anyway, the forward warp tool is the one I use the most because it just literally lets you push. I don't know why it's called a forward warp tool. You can use it in any direction you want. But it lets you push pixels around. There are all kinds of different tools. I'll show you a couple different examples of some of the other tools in just a minute. But let's say that I want to push this sleeve in. Now, my brush is whatever size it was in it was the last time. You always want to make your brush about the size of whatever it is you're trying to push. It will make it look more natural when your brush is the right size. If your brush is too small, it will be no more noticeable and it will take you a lot more work to do it. If your brush is too big, you may be pulling in stuff you don't need to pull in. Now, this is a, on a plain background, so there's no risk of pulling a pattern in. So we're not going to really see anything happen that uh, necessarily shouldn't look, shouldn't look the way it's looking. But using this big brush, I can pull the edges of the sweater in um, just like so. And if we zoom back out, there it is. All right, so uh, if we click OK, or we just turn the preview off, that's before, that's after. So just a quick push of the sleeve in. And we click OK. And because that was a smart object, we can always turn the liquify off. We can turn it back on. We can double click to get back into those settings and do whatever we want. So that's why we do the smart object first before we run the filter. That way we always have the ability to go back in and undo it or turn it off or whatever. Okay, so I'm going to close this. I don't need to save it. Just want to show you that one. Let's go back in. I'm going to show you another example um, using one of the tools here. Let's go into one of my other stock photos. Uh, if you ever take a picture of me from the side, I will kill you. No, I'm just kidding. Don't take pictures of people from the side that, that don't like pictures of them taken from the side because then they end up with 
things they don't want people to see or don't want emphasized. <laughs> so anyway, now here's the challenge. Uh, we can easily push the stomach in, make maybe lose three or four pounds, but there's a there's a column here on behind him or off in the distance. If we pull that column, that column's going to come in too. So here's what we want to do. First, run our smart object first, filter, convert for smart filters. And then um, we go into the liquify again. Okay. And if now if I do it, see, that's what happens. And I exaggerated it, but that's what would happen. You would start to see that pole pull in too. So that would be a dead giveaway. You liquefied. And trust me, when we see people's bodies that look probably like they might have been Photoshopped, we look around the edges to see if we can catch stuff that got pulled because it looks like it was liquefied. All right, so here's what we do. We go in and there's a tool called the freeze mask tool. The freeze mask tool is a separate brush that doesn't change anything about the image. All this brush does is just make stuff red. No, but what it really does is when you use this brush, everything that's red or everything that you're brushing will not move. So you're, you're freezing the stuff that you're brushing right now. So none of that stuff I just brushed will move now. So if I go back to the warp tool, hit the letter W, make my brush a little smaller. And don't exaggerate too much. And just pull in a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. We're not going to give them a six pack. We're not going to make it crazy. But we just take off a few pounds there. All right. So let's say that's enough. And now again, the before, the after. But if we click OK, click OK. That column did not move. It did not change the structure of the column. So that way you get um, <laughs> one of the consequences of working from home. I think this picture was taken before we were working from home. But anyway, uh, yeah, you have the ability to do that. Uh, do I have camera raw, raw presets to share? I don't have any, but um, I'm sure there are tons out there to download. So anyway, that's the freeze mask tool in Liquify to accomplish the same thing when there's something in the background you don't want to disturb, get disturbed. Can you bring his belt up? Sure, I can liquefy up as well and, and push the belt up. You can do that, but I'm not gonna uh, spend a lot of time on it. But to answer your question, yes, it can be done. Uh, all right, let's see, I think I had one more. Yep, I do have one more example of liquefy before we move on. And this next example is a face liquefy. And this is not where I need to push necessarily things around. This is the common one part of your face is bigger or smaller or closed. One eye was closed, one eye is more open, so forth and so on. So his right eye is bigger or more wide open than his left eye. So when you go into filter, convert for smart filters, and then you go into liquefy. Now, by the way, while you're in the filter menu, you might be tempted to say, oh, it's right there at the top. Don't do that. <laughs> the one at the very top, as opposed to this one, this is do it again. This is a repeat of the last one you did. So this would be trying to push in the side of the image where the stomach used to be and messing up his chin or his jacket or something that uh, was in the last image. So this is if you were trying to repeat the exact same filter on multiple images, that's why they put the last one you did at the top but you would always want to go down, in this case, to liquefy to start from scratch. All right, so now we go to liquefy, and I'm going to un unveil face aware liquefy. And if there's even if uh, the opportunity, if there was multiple faces in the image, like a group shot, you'd be able to pick face one, face two, face three. All right, so we're going to go to eyes, and we have uh, the left eye and the right eye. So we can, or the left side and the right side, I guess is the easier way to say it. So we can reduce the eye size on that eye. So we can make it super big or make it subtly more small. Great. We can also adjust the height of that eye. So a little bit lower there. And we can even adjust the width of that eye, which we don't need to, but we could adjust the width. And again, just make it look more natural. All right. So um, there's even tilt which we don't need to do, but it's there if you needed it. Um, put that back to zero. 
there's I distance. And uh, here, yep, let me get out of, out of, let me go to the face tool. There we go. If I go to the face tool, you notice that when I hover, when I'm on the face br brush or tool, when I hover over the different parts of the image, I was doing everything using the sliders. You can also do everything on the canvas. So you can just pick up a, a, a point and move it around on the canvas. Um, you can turn the eye right there. You can do, so you, you don't have to necessarily do it in the, um, in the panel. You can do it right here on the canvas itself. So we can make him happier now that we did this. There we go. He's happy. He's happy his eye looks better. And there we are. The, but the pupils are different now. They're not going to be perfect. So you might want to do some more Photoshop work, Greg, if you want them to look more the same. So, uh, yeah, I noticed this one pupil is now a little bit smaller than this one. So I might want to paint a little bit more iris around this one. Might want to take out one of the catch lights because there's three catch lights in this eye that more than that one. I could even duplicate that pupil and move it over there. So there's that was just to show you the filter. That's not saying this is the final image. If you need to do more, do more. But that's what the filter does. All right. Um, yep. So I would, honestly, I now that I got the eye kind of the right size, I copy one of the pupils and duplicate it, flip it over, and paste it over on the other one. But that's not what this is about. This is filters. All right, so let's go on. Uh, so that was Liquify. Next one, let's talk about neural filters. So neural filters are the newest set of filters in Photoshop. And um, there's a, there are always new neural filters. There's, um, at max, we introduced the new landscape mixer. So here's a, just another stock scene. Looks like a spring or summer in the forest. And uh, with the landscape mixer, you can go in and change. You can combine multiple photos into a scene. So you can like take one landscape and and put it on top of another landscape and blend them together. Or you can literally just change the landscape to a different time of year or different whatever. So for example, let's go to filter. Let's go to, um, now I'm not gonna do the convert for smart filters first because the neural filters, I think all of them, but certainly the ones I'm gonna use, output as a different layer anyway. So it's never not gonna hurt, hurt your original. So you don't have to convert for smart filters to run a neural filter. So I'm gonna go to neural filters and I'm gonna choose a landscape mixer and just turn it on. Nothing happens by turning it on because you're just bringing up the interface. So you have, let me show you the three areas to work on. So number one, they're presets. So these are just built in. These are just sample images that you can, like remember I said, you can combine one on top of another. These are sample ones you can combine on top of your existing landscape. So if I were to pick, hey, I want this to look more wintry and I were to pick the winter um, preset, and we let it process, we let it process, we let it process. Then I turn my scene into winter, just like that. So it took the wintry mountain scene and applied it to my spring summery scene. It, it's just amazing the level of detail. Snow on the trees, the whole nine yards, snow on the ground that this did just by picking the preset. Okay, uh, let's go in and let's um, let's reset it. So the reset button is up here in the upper left corner. Reset parameters. That just turns it off. Okay, so I can pick different presets. If you have your own photo you want to use, you can just go to custom and select the layer because you would have had to have the layer already in the image. The layer you want to use to combine with this one, you would select it and away you would go. So presets are the built-in ones. Custom is your own image. Um, now, what is the stuff down here? These are just sliders you can apply to your existing image without needing a preset or another image. So for example, there is a winter slider. If I just drag the winter slider over, it kind of does the same thing. It's not gonna be the exact same look because I'm just using a slider and it's guessing what winter would look like in the scene and I can just drag it over that way. So you can drag the amount of winter you want, um, just make it a little colder, 
<laughs> make it a little more barren, make it a little bit full on winter, your choice. Um, if I, I haven't tried this one in this image, but I want to see what sunset would do. Oh, that's pretty cool. Sunset makes it warmer, makes the sky more orange, gives me kind of a sunset look to this. So these are, this is the landscape mixer neural filter. That's a little much. Let's pull back, pull back. Eh, maybe something like that. Like I don't like what it's doing to the sky per se, but what it's doing to the foreground is awesome. Um, maybe pull back a little bit more. Yeah, the sky is getting trashed. Uh, so it's not doing a great job in the clouds, but it's AI. AI doesn't always do a great job. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But here's the thing. Remember I said it's gonna output as a new layer? So I can click OK. It output that as a totally new layer, does not touch the original. Now I could mask out what I don't want or do a select sky and change the sky to something better. I can do, I can finish it now that it's done its part in the filter to whatever I want to do. Okay. Um, that's someone asking another question. Okay. She changed reality too much. All right. Uh, yes, this is April 1st. I, I promise none of these are April 1st jokes. All right, but anyway, that's um, that's the landscape mixer neural filter. Let's close this one, and let's go back, and let's go to colorize. All right, I showed uh, I showed this one. This is a photo of my parents um, back in the day. I showed this one at Max uh, during my keynote, and. Um, I just said, I wonder what this would have looked like had it been in color. There was no color photography back then. What would this have looked like? Or at least not that they could afford at the time. So we go to filter, neural filter, neural filters. And um, we ch just turn on colorize. So a couple things while we're in the neural filter before we turn this one on. Featured are the ones that the team feel are ready for prime time. Like they feel these are good enough to start using. Beta means they're a work in progress, just like anything else in beta. So the landscape mixer is by no, me by no means finished. It's a work in progress. Makeup transfer is a work in progress. Color transfers, all of these are work in progress. So um, if you like the results after you run it, there's a yes button. Are you satisfied with the results? Click yes. You'll always, always have the option to upload your results, whether they're good or bad, if you choose to. You don't have to. But you can say, yes, this filter did what I expected it to do. No, this filter did not do what I expected it to do. And you can explain what it didn't do that you wanted it to do. Okay, um, so let's go in and, and turn on Colorize. And uh, I'm always blown away by this particular filter because of what it chooses like for the most part with skin tones. Like for example, there's there's some issues with this particular image. My mom's arm got a little too gray or whatever here. This, whatever this is on the table should probably not have changed. His sleeve got a little too brown or whatever this is bleeding over from uh, her dress. But um, the skin tones are, are pretty good. So let's go in to adjustments. And for example, I can now click on part of the image. I can say, for example, this little napkin thing, whatever this is on the table, brings up my color picker. And I can say, no, 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 leave that kind of white, leave that where it was. Okay, and then I can change it. Then for her arm, I can click over there. And I can say, yeah, for her arm. Um, no, don't make that white, <laughs> hang on, undo. For her arm, let's go in and let's go here and just and kind of maybe go there. See what that does? Not enough. So this particular, um, there are parts of this I would go in and have to manually touch. But for the most part, it's doing a really good job at what it is doing. And so there are examples where it can get you 80 to 90% of the way there on a colorization, as, as opposed to you having to start from scratch zero and having to paint it all in yourself. So let's say I click OK on that. That outputs that color as a new layer. 
I can go in and say, no, 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 this part of the arm, I need to paint this in to match the rest of her other part of her arm. And, uh, you know, other things that need to change need to change. Let me show you a landscape example. And here's another one. And I also showed this one during the keynote. And filter and neural filter. Neural filter. And colorize. And keep in mind, um, if you don't like the results, you can always say no. But that's just a one click colorization. It got most of the things right. I don't like the brown in the sky, but it got mostly everything else right. So the brown in the sky that I don't like, uh, same thing. I would go click on that brown somewhere up in the sky up here in the upper right corner and say, no, 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 that sky probably should be more on the blue side or maybe that blue. And then it will change that brown out to whatever color you selected. So, uh, and again, all of this outputs as a new layer. So if you missed something, it didn't get something just right, you can go in now and tweak it without having to start from scratch. Okay. Um, that's the, oh, one more. There's one more. I was going to say that's the neural filters, but I got one more, one more example. Oh, hang on, I went too far. Let's go back. One more example. Let's close up Colorize and let's go down to this one. So one of the dead giveaways when doing compositing, we spend a lot of time trying to make the cutout look good. So the hair should be no edges of the original background. It should look clean when we put it on the new background. But one of the dead giveaways that you put an image on a different background is not the edges, although that can be, but it's the color. Like the color of this studio shot is not matching this fall scene that it was composited on. So this is just a composite. There's the original scene. She was just dropped in right in the middle. And again, the cutout's fine. It's the, the color that doesn't look convincing because it's too bright, too white, too studio lighted versus if this were taken there, she would not be that bright that way, unless you took a studio strobe out in the, out in the woods. Um, even then she probably still wouldn't be that bright. So select the layer you want to color or you want to harmonize, go to filter, come down to neural filters. And there is a beta filter called harmonization. So when you turn on harmonization, nothing happens because what it's asking you to do is choose the layer because you already chose the layer you want to harmonize which is her layer one you want to choose because if you had more than one layer what layer you want to harmonize it against in this case the background now it's going to overdo it it's going to overcook it so this is a beta so if i were going to submit the answer to this it would be no i don't like the results because it's too much but keep in mind they give you a slider so i just think the default strength in most cases is too high you, but you can pull it down. So I can say, no, it's not necessarily a, a can't use it. It's just too burned. So I'll pull it down to maybe somewhere around the middle and let it recalculate. And that's about, that's better. So here's your before. Here's your after. Maybe a little bit more. But you would tweak it to your heart's content until you got it to be the color you want it to look like. And uh, then you can go from there. You could also do it twice. You can maybe duplicate the layer, do it again, and do it fully cooked for the clothing and another layer for her. So, so it's not fully cooked. So that way you can get the best of both worlds. But that's the beauty of it being a filter. You can just run it as many times as you want on as many copies of the layers you want to get it the way you want it to look. All right, so we click OK. That's a work in progress. So I'm... I'm uh, there's no, there's no, it's okay button. It's either a yes or a no. I, I would click the it's okay button. It's not perfect. It's not bad. It's, it's okay. <laughs> so I'd probably click yes and then explain what could have been better. So when you do click yes, you get to um, check all the boxes you want and then explain in more detail to give the team feedback on what this filter didn't do or did perfectly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip it. All right, click OK. And again, that comes back as a different layer. And again, you can tweak that layer, do whatever you want that layer, because you still have your original. So you can go run it again on your original 
and do as much, many different ways to combine them together as you want. Okay, uh, next up, let's, that was the neural filters. Now let's go in, let's go back to Lightroom where I've got an image here. And let's move this image over. So this is an image I took just with my iPhone. And I took this image using portrait mode on my iPhone. So portrait mode is that kind of simulating depth of field. Now, portrait mode put uh, portrait mode puts a depth map in the HEIC file. And I, it's a struggle to get that file with that map from your phone. <laughs> Because if you airdrop it from your phone, it just airdrops it as a JPEG. If you transfer it from your phone using iCloud to Photos, to the Photos app, and then import it into Lightroom, Lightroom loses the map. So the only way I've found is to let it sync up to iCloud, sync back down into Photos app on the computer, and X, there's a feature in the Photos app on the computer File export untouched original. So don't mess with it. Don't convert it to a JPEG. Leave it the original file that came off the camera. Now, even though this is the original file, if I choose edit in Photoshop, it's not going to bring the depth map over. So what I got to do is I got to show it to me in the finder. Like show me that file in the finder or the operating system. Yeah, the finder in this case. There it is. There's the original HIC and double click and open that in Photoshop that will bring the depth map over. Any other way wants to convert it, wants to do the friendly thing for you and make it more accessible and make it a JPEG and throw away unnecessary data. I want the data. So why do I care about that depth map so much? Because Photoshop can take advantage of it. So if you shot, this is the scenario, you shot portrait mode, you have a depth map in your image you can now use Photoshop's lens, lens blur filter to refocus the image to a different spot. That's the beauty of it. So if I go to my filter menu, come down to blur and choose lens blur, which has been enhanced to look more realistic. Let me pull the window over. There we are. You have a, um, it'll say depth map if it brought it over. If it doesn't say depth map up here for depth, map <laughs> it'll either say just transparency and layer mask that means the file did not bring it over so jpeg doesn't support it hic does support it but you got to bring over the hic file unedited and that way it will bring the depth map over with it now that it's there i can go in and i could um, for example change the uh, blur distance and i can even change the radius of the blur and now because i have this tool set focal point i can click and, and see what it did? It changed the focal point to the to the globe here, to the glass um, shape. And now the chairs are blurry. If I click on the chairs, the chairs are in focus. And this is out of focus. If I click back here, uh, that stuff's in focus back here and everything else in the foreground's not. If I click the table, the table's kind of in focus and starting to get in, out of focus as it goes back. If I click the bottom here, that's in focus. So I can literally, after the fact, change where the focus point should be, where I want you to pay attention, and I can even make it more out of focus, more shallow depth of field to do that. Do you know if that workflow works for video? I do not know, I've never tried it on video. Uh, I would imagine no, because I don't think you can run the lens blur filter on video, but I've never tried. All right, um, I want that little spot on the table to be in focus. Now that little spot on the table is in focus. Nope, I don't like that in focus. Let's turn it back. So it's pretty cool to be able to do this kind of after the fact editing. And I think we're just gonna see more and more of this where the shot you wished were in focus wasn't as in focus, but there's a map so you can make the part in focus you want in focus. It's just, I, I think the possibilities are are endless and I think we're just starting to see the beginning of it. So when I click OK, that becomes my rendered image. Now, when, remember when I said some filters don't let you use smart filter, smart objects? This is one, unless they changed it recently. Like the last time I tried this, it didn't work if I converted it to a smart object first. 
So just this is one of those one of those few examples where converting to a smart filter first won't work. All right, uh, I'm gonna not save that. Let's move on. All right, uh, next filter. I got like five minutes to blow through these next few. I should be able to make it. Uh, let's go in and talk about um, Gaussian blur. Gaussian blur is one of my favorite filters of all time. It's one of the oldest filters of all time. What do I use it for? So Gaussian blur is literally to make things blurry. So if you were trying to blur out the background of an image, you could select the background. All right, actually, let me do that. Let me go. And just trying to see if I have an example to use. This is where I'm going to run out of time. Trying to do something that was un, unplanned. All right, let's 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 open up this guy. And his background is pretty much out of focus already. But let's say we were to, wanted to make it more out of focus. We could say select subject. That should select him. We can then invert that selection. Select inverse. So now the background's in focus. Or the background's selected, not in focus. We can go to filter. Gaussian blur. Blur. Gaussian blur. And now, and bring over the Gaussian blur panel. There it is. And now if we tweak it, we're literally making the background completely out of focus to where you don't even know what it used to be. So that's what Gaussian blur was always for. It was for blurring things. Um, but, and, and it's one of my favorite filters. As a photographer, you should definitely know about it because there are times you're gonna need to do stuff like this. However, what I use it for a lot now is skin softening. It's one of the oldest ways of doing skin softening. There are better, more sophisticated techniques and I'm not going to get into those right now, but there are definitely some more sophisticated techniques to do. But one of my favorite older ways to do it is to duplicate the layer, uh, blur the whole layer, blur, Gaussian blur, not that much. Pick a number where we can still see skin, but we've softened it quite a bit. Click OK. And then hold down your Option or Alt key and click the layer mask to hide the whole thing you just behind a mask. So this, this blurry version is hidden behind that mask because now I can use my paintbrush with white paint to paint in the softening. So I don't want her, her nose and lips to be softened, but skin, I can go ahead and soften using this technique. Now, it's a little overkill, it's a little too much because I still want to be able to see pores, but because it's a layer, you can always just lower the opacity until you get it as soft as you want, all the way down to no softness, or crank up the softness to as much or as little as you want using that technique. That's why I like it, because it's just easy. <laughs> there are definitely uh, other ways and better ways to do it now, but like I just like that way because it's just easy. All right, so I still use that way. All right, next up, close. Don't save. All right, let's go and grab. Let's go to Lightroom actually and grab this one. I'm gonna grab this one, this one. I'm gonna grab all these. So I don't have to keep going back and forth. All right. We head back to Photoshop. Those should start opening. Maybe. Maybe not. Okay, weird. Weird, weird, weird. I've got myself, oh, it's, it's thinking about it. I'm asking it to do a bunch of things and I'm not waiting for it to do them. Oh, come on, don't tell me we're not going to get this open in time. The clock's ticking. All right, let me see. We've got a question while I'm waiting. Oh, I'm going to force quit it if it, does, if it doesn't happen. I, I told it to open up three images and I canceled it. I told it to open up another. And so it's like it's just trying to do all the stuff I told it to do. All right, here. Let's 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 not wait. 
I'd wait, but I'm not going to wait. All right, let's open up Photoshop again. Oh, one of the images did open. That I was trying to open, so it did remember. I just wasn't giving Lightroom enough time. And let's open up Edit Copy. There we go. And one more. Okay. While we're waiting, let's go ahead and move on. I'm just going to wait now. Is this the one that's taking too long? Yes, no. Ah, oh, it's that last one that's killing it. I'm out of time. Out of time. All right, folks, I was out of time. So the last filters I was going to show you were the render filters. So if you go under render, you have the ability to do flame, picture frame, and tree. And I was going to show you smart sharpen. But I got carried away trying to do it too fast. And now if I do it, I'm going to get cut off while I wait it. But just quickly, 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 let's show you this one. Even if I get cut off, you'll know why. So, um, and if you're still watching on YouTube, I won't be cut off. I'll just be cut off on Behance. So let's go ahead and create a new filter. And let's go ahead and uh, filter, render. So frame, picture frame, flame, and tree. So we're going to do picture frame. That will literally bring up a window with your choices of picture frames. I'm not going to go through all the choices, but let's click OK. That created on a new layer like I told it to, and now I can go free transform. Hold down my shift key because I don't want to scale it proportionally and reshape the picture frame into my photo. And now that I've got my photo, I can go ahead and transfer that layer or, or free transform that layer to kind of not be so tight on the edges of the frame. So picture frame is literally just that, as <laughs> you create picture frames. And uh, last but not least, if I were to do uh, filter, um, filter, let's do render and tree, for example, that brings up a variety of different trees you can choose. So there's all kinds of different trees. Pick the one you want. Pick the lighting, the light direction the way you want. So you can relight the tree. Click OK. Oh, and always put that on a new layer. So let's undo that. New layer, because then you'll have the new layer to be able to scale it down and do whatever you want. So filter, tree. There it is. Zoom out. Free transform. And now I can go ahead and scale the tree down to whatever size I want. And put it wherever I want and blend it and use camera raw filter on it do whatever I want because it is its own layer and last 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 but not least is the sharpening so if we zoom in on this image it looks okay but those numbers aren't as sharp as they could be so let's go to filter let's go to um, sharpen and let's go to smart sharpen and Smart Sharpen is a dialog box that you can go in and adjust the numbers for, the amount. And if I really crank this up and click OK. So again, if we zoom in, hang on, oops, zoom in. So that's, that's after, that's before. So you can even see the edge, how blurry that looks compared to that. So it makes a subtle difference but it's a big enough difference for the entire image that sharpening is always the way to go for sharpening the edges. All right. Cheers, everybody. I'm over my time. I got cut off already on Behance, but at least the YouTube people will be able and everybody else will be able to continue seeing it. All right. So with that said, thanks and stay tuned for the uh, Adobe Creative Challenge over on Behance. Cheers, everybody. Have a great weekend.